Ooh. All right, thank you everyone for joining us for our afternoon session. I'm really, really excited about this one. Um, and yeah, I think we should just straight away introduce um, three wonderful panel members that we've got. So um, I'll give, let them give you a little wave and then um, just by means of the order that you're on my screen. Um, Rajiv, do you want to introduce yourself first and then Nona and then Faith? Hi everyone, um, I'm Rajiv. I am a ordinand at Ripon College Cudston. Um, before that I was a teacher and I'm really interested in liberation theology and um, exploring identity and culture and intersectionality. <laughs> awesome. Um, hi, I'm Nona. Um, I am the Gender Inclusion Lead for Inclusive Gathering Birmingham. Um, I'm also doing a PhD at the moment in trans studies um, and I'm generally interested in intersectionality inclusion and how we can kind of make spaces safer for marginalised people. Hi, I'm Faith. I am a postgraduate researcher at the University of Birmingham seeking my PhD in religion and theology. And I'm interested in exploring um, what uh, Pentecostal theology has to add to the ecumenical discussion of atonement, uh, specifically from the perspective of survivors of sexual abuse and trauma studies. Cool. So these amazing people are going to do most of the talking. Um, I'm just going to ask questions, or in fact, I'm going to ask a question. Um, and then we'll keep going until you guys have managed to ask your own. So um, feel free to put any questions that you've got in the chat and I'll try and pick them up as we go along. Um, just a couple of kind of things to mention before we start, obviously, um, Faith in particular is researching something that's quite sensitive um, and it may bring stuff up for people. So um, if anything that we talk about um, either triggers you in some way or means that you need to take a step back, then please feel free to step out of the session for a little bit, um, step away from your computer. Um, and as we already covered, if someone says something that is insensitive, um, then please, and, and we don't pick up on it, then please, um, let us know um, and we'll address it in a necessary way if but I'm not not imagining that'll be a problem um, and the other thing just to say is obviously we're talking about diversity and intersectionality and not all the ways that can be experienced will be presented in this conversation we've got an hour um, we are not going to cover everything that is important and everything that is meaningful or needs to be said in that hour but I do think it's going to be a really fruitful and really great conversation um, and when this does go out, when the recording does go out, we will share alongside that resources um, from other perspectives, particularly um, black theology, disability theology, um, other things that the people on the panel aren't necessarily speaking into from their own experience today. Um, so yeah, just to say, we're not, we're not just speaking about this because we think everything important is gonna be said in this one hour, um, but lots of important things will be said. And I think that's, that's a really good thing. It's a really good place for us to start today. So without further ado, um, it's really great that the theme for this retreat has kind of come together on its own. We've kind of broadly titled it Resilient Discipleship, um, but what's come out of that is actually been um, different sessions and different resources about building a sense of embodiment into our faith and, and our faith practices. Um, and from this conversation, we're really hoping to look at that from a perspective of um, intersectionality and diversity. Um, and so my first question for this panel, um, and they can pick it up in whatever order they like, um, is what does it mean for our faith to be a full body experience? <coughs> Dropping things, sorry. So sorry, I, I glitched out uh, in the middle there because of my unstable connection. So I gather the question was, what does it mean for our faith to be a full bodied experience? I heard that much. Was there more after that? Nope, that's it. Okay. Any of you want to take it on first? Yeah, I got Russ. So I've got two, five, well, I've got five year old twins who are homeschooling. So I came back at this question with more questions. Um, and so my mind sort of jumps to whose bodies, um, whose experiences, 
um, <laughs> what experiences, and then when we talk about faith, especially given last night, um, whose faith? Is it the white Jesus that you hear about, or is it Yeshua, who people like who the people like De La Torres argue for? Um, and this idea of bodies and church brought me to something I've blogged about before, where the first nativity that my son went to, so he's dual heritage. Um, my wife Freya's from Somerset. I grew up in Newham, in East London, um, and we were in Somerset. And it was one of those services for the a nativity service where you just turn up and you could get dressed. And the person, the welcomer said, oh, he doesn't need to get dressed. He's the right skin color for it. And I was like, I was too shocked to respond to that because I was, you're in that state of, has this just happened? And it was a real eye-opening experience coming from a more multicultural background. Um, of this idea of somebody's aren't really accepted in, in church or somebody's experienced that marginalization. Um, and that's not only skin color um, because you get to these knots in liberation theologies where people will argue for race, but then suddenly go very quiet about other aspects of identity like um, gender, which is where you get womanism from and sexuality. Um, and then it becomes almost a, an oppression Olympics. So that was sort of where I began, um, because especially thinking about tensions that are close to my heart, not necessarily close to me, um, but via Twitter close to my heart. Yeah, yes, yesterday, or last night for us, outside um, the Capitol, you see a large cross being put up, but that's not the cross that red letter Christians, uh, I imagine, gathered together. That's not our faith. Um, in the same way, Jada and um, Britain First walking through, talking about, I'm a Christian, and you're thinking, but this is not the call in the gospel as I see it. So I think it was is really important to start exploring um, whose faith and what are they trying to do with that faith? Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants to bounce in. <laughs> well, um, I'll talk about my project specifically in terms of being embodied. <clears throat> One of the core things I'm looking at in my project is um, our understanding of the relationship between the body and the self. And so who are ourselves as bodies? So um, to go into it a little more specifically, I'm specifically uh, challenging the notion around embodiment of the concept of uh, bodily autonomy. So I'm challenging the concept that's it's often perceived as a way to kind of help and honor the experiences of survivors. But um, there's kind of this unchallenged uh, theoretical assumption under a lot of uh, theologies that arise to help survivors that we somehow have a right to autonomy over our own bodies. Now, I think that sounds good, but when you start to break that apart, uh, what I found is that um, it's inconsistent, both with what we've learned about uh, how people recover from trauma and with the message of the gospel. So if you look at what we're saying there, I have autonomy over my own body. So if you're looking at that over, you have a conception of who is the one practicing the autonomy and where are they located? So what I'm challenging is this assumption that there's, there's this kind of self that exists separately from the body that um, essentially exercises rights over it. And essentially this concept of autonomy being this idea of control and um, looking at how that conception of the self arises. And it's like really interrogating for whom would it seem natural to assume that like myself can um, possess and control essentially a piece of property, which I define as my body. And um, what does that do to our, our understanding of redemption? So how, how are self and body connected if if like I see my body as essentially a piece of property that I'm separate from and I exercise rights over. So what I'm looking at is um, how can we have a more con 
a more kind of integrative sense of, uh, of self, of what it means to be autonomous, our ability to um, essentially exercise our agency, which becomes damaged for survivors. They, they can't, that really becomes damaged. So that's a really wordy kind of look at kind of how I understand self and body here. Thank you. No, that's really, yeah, brings up some really, really interesting points. Um, yeah, no, no, is there anything that you wanted to add to Austin said already? Sorry. Um, yeah. um, I guess when I kind of looked at this question, um, I kind of thought about, well, what does it mean for it to be a full body experience? Um, and I thought about how as a transgender Christian, um, you know, we often face obstacles and exclusion and how, um, you know, Bible passages can, you know, even be used as um, one of those tools of, of kind of exclusion. Um, so when we consider this question of faith being a full body experience, we kind of ask ourselves when we come to worship, um, you know, can, can I bring my full self? Um, you know, is it safe for me to be open here? Will I be physically safe and accepted? Um, when we enter these spaces and you know as a trans person that's the question that we have to navigate every day every time we enter a space we kind of navigate those questions so um, for worship to be a full body experience we need the spaces that we we enter to welcome our bodies and our full selves um, you know trans people are disproportionately affected by poverty homelessness job insecurity um, and um, so yeah, and, and um, something I really liked um, in Austin Harkey's book, he says, um, when our churches support or even organically formulate the idea that trans people are morally, intellectually or theologically inferior, we feed in right into this hatred that leads to death for an already marginalized group. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's about understanding this context and this history and, and as churches creating that safe space, um, you know, and being affirming for trans people, um, but yeah, making sure that the, the our spaces are safe because you know, it's some of, for some of us it's hard to bring to bring our full selves unless we know that that space is something that that's going to be um, going to be a safe space. And you know, I kind of agree with that idea about you know whose bodies, um, you know whose bodies are we talking about? Because you know, um, when you know when we talk about bodies, it's often you know white cis um, able bodies, um, which you know. That's that's not you know that's not the, the sort of you know that's not the bodies that I think you know we, we need to be centering our, our kind of our, our welcome on because you know those bodies have traditionally been accepted. Yeah, thank you. I as as you were talking, I'm I'm kind of struck by um, again going going back to things that have escalated over the last twenty four hours um, with kind of certain factions of, of Christians in America. Um, and seeing the way that Jesus's body is presented in certain circles. Is he presented as someone who is from Middle Eastern origin or is he presented as a more palatable Jesus, a more palatable body um, for, for people to, to worship um, in those spaces? Um, and so I guess, yeah, le leading on to that, what do you think... I guess we no, no, you've touched on it a little bit, but I guess the consequences for the church, I mean, if we if we continue to create spaces where not everyone can bring their whole selves, what you know, what what is lost in in doing that, do you think? Um, well, for me, um, the consequence was that I didn't believe that myself as a trans person and then my Christian um, identity could be one. I know I, I sort of believed that, you know, there's this part of me over here and then there was a part of me over there and those two parts don't, you know, can't be in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, when we don't, you know, have this kind of radical inclusion, this kind of re-centering of all bodies, it does create this dissonance between, you know, I can't be all of the things I am in this space. Um, and that, you know, that, you know, creates fragmentation of identity and you know, has, you know, far reaching um, impact, so. I, I think as well, um, the church that has to 
turn and deal with the legacy it has between faith and bodies because you know going back to faith faith's point um about the body as property i was it brought to mind the you know the church as an institution has decrees over bodies about and that uh, manifests itself in marriage in um in a um a, uh, abortion in issues of um, co contraception um, in in really unhelpful unloving pastoral comments about healing um, and pr actually not biblically based um, if they're done properly and also the legacy of you know if you talk about uh, a person of color's perspective slavery and empire and oppression as well and so I think there's there's a call for the church and it's like if not now when to dig deep into the roots of those and to actually expose things because what coming from a Church of England perspective and speaking personally um, I see is if you don't do that you just end up with multiple compromises and we've got that with the seat with um in my view with the Church of England and the living and love and faith documentation that came out and then a series of videos that clearly had been prepped prior to um, and then having been to a different theological college before Cudston I had known some of these people and I'd sat in the chapel real being very conscious that it wasn't my skin color that people didn't want to talk to me it was because I was wearing a rainbow lanyard as an ally mm. and it's about naming in effect naming that evil and Dorothy Soul has this um phrase Christo fascist where in effect to summarize you take the bible and you wrap it in a flag and then you sell it and that's what's happening that like, you know that's what we saw yesterday on, on on our screens that's what we see with um uh, edl and britain first etc it's that nationalism but for the church to be and church leadership to be active in taking that on and sort of each of us doing our thing in our backyard but being like a coalition of people leading it rather than having the archbishop of canterbury saying what sounds like a good sound bite on Twitter last night, but actually isn't necessarily uh, exploring the whole tensions around America and democracy. Um, I think that's a really important piece of work because actually, if you look at the red letters in your Bible, um, Jesus just saw people. Um, and that was a really, that's an eye-opening thing. And the fact that when I've had bereavements, you know, it's the Hindu man in the corner shop who's shown me more love than when I was at Wycliffe and there wasn't much pastoral care for me at that point. Um, people just seeing people and that you see that in schools and you see that in society, but ironically in some way, the church doesn't necessarily bring that forward um, because we're, we're fighting over theologies that don't often feel like they're not based in loving each other. Or loving God, which apparently are a bit important. Mm -hmm. And I missed what the Archbishop of Canterbury said on Twitter, so I'm going to have to look that up after this. So thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, there's a um, couple of people picking up. Um, again, Jill shared she has a, a similar experience of not feeling like she can bring her full self to church. Um, and Catherine sharing that it's it's interesting that when Jesus was here, he mainly spoke to people outside of the mainstream religious institution. Um, and where we are today, the much of the established church is still not accepting of, of all people. Um, something that I I think uh, you know, I'll share personally myself as well. I'm um, a queer person. I'm, I live with my partner, Lizzie. Um, my experience of church was I, I have faced rejection. I've also found uh, a home in church now. Um, and I guess I want to kind of raise a question around the, the place of, of people who have experienced marginalization and continue to experience marginalization within the church. There's, you know, people often find different um, callings um, within whether they should kind of stay within institutions try and change it from the inside or lead from the outside um and i guess yeah where where have you guys if you're happy to share found yourself on that journey and and yeah what what do you feel like you bring into that 
I'm, I'm happy to kick off again, but I'm also a chatterbox and seeing where my daughter gets it from now. Um, so Nadia Boltzweber is really helpful because she's left the church and when I saw her a couple of years ago inside the cathedral, she was like, you need both. You need people inside the church to um, critique it, but you also need people outside who don't have the, the thought of actually, if I do this, I might lose my house um, and having, having a tandem of movement. But for us, I know others here are also like ordinands or in curacy. Um, I find, and it's something that a lot of people keep coming back to in our conversations with trainee vicars, going, well, why are we here? Why are we doing this? And I find the, there's a, the film Mad Max Fury Road, so you might have to just stay with me for a second. And if you haven't seen the film, this I'll just fill it with spoilers. Um, but the whole film is a giant U-turn because they're in the desert, they're at the citadel and it's the only place where there's water and they escape the oppressive regime and then realize that the, the green place where it was their hope doesn't exist. And then Max's probably longest line is to tell them to do a U-turn and go back. And I think that's an important thing to remember because the water and you know red letters is a really helpful way to remember that of the gospel is true and clear and feeding and the spirit is there feeding us. And so for those of us who are called to stay in the church, because it is a discernment, I think, or to come to, to lead groups like this, which are on the, you know, cusp that, but on the cusp of that boundary, to, to remember that that's where you are. Because when I'm sat there with people who are saying horrendous things and using the Bible, I sit in lecture thinking, are we reading the same Bible? Um, that's what you're doing. And that's, that's the call. And as, alongside of that, if you're not there, who's going to do that for you, uh, for your children? So that's my other uh, Manic Street Preacher link, which is if you tolerate this, this will be the heritage that your children engage with. And do I want my daughter if she's, you know, whoever she brings home, I want her to bring them home. And church is part of that home. And so if if the door's not wide enough, we need to bring in another door. That sort of, mm -hmm. if that gives you an insight into to where my position on that or how I cope with that tension, I don't know about the rest of the people here. Well, um, my journey is, um, I also left the church for a very long time. Um, so I grew up in a fundamentalist Pentecostal church. Um, I was one of those people I was much more devoted to it than the rest of my family. And uh, I left as a teen um, as, you know, I started asking questions that I got the sense I wasn't supposed to ask. Um, I heard messages about gay people being condemned to hell for eternity and it was very fear-based. And so I just got to a point where I couldn't worship a God that wanted to to torture me essentially. So um, I ended up um, exploring a lot of different religions and I was pagan, um, neo-pagan for about 15 years. And um, from that, I sort of came back into the church through Unitarian Universalism because um, that was a space where it was kind of more of a gathered community than um, some of the pagan groups I've been part of. Um, and so, my coming back to the church, actually, uh, the Christian church came through uh, going to seminary, which I entered uh, with the intention of being a Unitarian Universalist minister. But um, actually, what brought me back was uh, studying theology and studying doctrine and uh, looking at like the historic um, creeds of the church, what had been central and kind of the twistedness I'd got from a, from the church that I was raised in and that in conjunction with uh, reading the gospels and having um, a deeply personal experience of Jesus, which um, was very much in line with um, the Pentecostal faith that I'd grown up with. Um, this caused a huge um, identity crisis for me because I had, in leaving the church, rejected all of Pentecostal spirituality and was basically like, there's nothing about this that can be redemptive. And so then, I had the challenge that my cohort was Unitarian Universalist and being like, as I was going on my journey, I really think that Jesus needs to be the center of this. And uh, Unitarian Universalism 
it arises out of uh, the liberal Protestant Christian tradition, but because of the nature of what it centers, um, I found that it was no longer a place for me. And I found myself again in a position where I was afraid to be honest about where I was on my journey. Cause I was like, if I'm honest about my spirituality and my values here, I'm gonna be excluded from my group. And so I found that I was having the same, I, a crisis of identity coming out of that, that I was in leaving fundamentalist Christianity. And so for me, I think it gets back to that sense of, um, you know, being able to bring my full self and it's like, can I bring my white trash, like Pentecostal, also progressive, full self in, into my faith? And so that's sort of where I am. And I, I, I use the term white trash for myself. I would never use it for anyone else just because like that's my background, so. Yes, yeah, um, interesting what, what both of you are saying, I think. Um, I think there's a, there's a sense of kind of safety in this kind of intervention, you know, um, when we put ourselves as marginalized people in those positions um, and try to kind of challenge, um, you know, what's going on around us that, you know, that's not always a safe place or a safe thing for us to do. I mean, I went to the church um, in near me and it was made very clear that, um, you know, my full self wasn't welcome. Um, and I had to make that decision, do I stay here and try and change it or do I go somewhere else? And, you know, I made that decision that this is not a safe place for me to make that intervention because, you know, I'm going to be putting myself in a place of danger. Um, I know I found a new church and um, a place that, you know, is, is a wonderful place for me to, to kind of explore that stuff. But yeah, I think, I think that idea of kind of safety is, is really important when, when we kind of have these, um, have these kind of conversations. And I think to sort of tag on the back of what Nona's saying, or both of you, um, there's also this idea that a really unhealthy and again, not necessarily helpful or true um, idea that God wants you to suffer and that you put yourself in a place of suffering because it's what God wants. And you know, we were part of a really conservative evangelical church and finding that more and more you're um, compromising and putting yourself away and it's all suffering and it has it's for the greater glory and um Delores Williams in her Sisters in the Wilderness books speaks of um actually we find God in the wilderness not in suffering and there's nothing glamorous in suffering and she puts forward um something that I had never encountered before which is to her Jesus defeats sin in the wilderness because in the temptations and there is nothing glorious or glamorous. You can't look to the, to the cross for anything other than horror and that kind of suffering we are not called to, to take part in. And so I think you, that's something to hold on to when discerning, because if you think, oh, well, maybe I'm here. This is why I left my last theological college to come to Cudston. Like there comes a point when you go, this is not for me. I can't change anything. And actually it, this, is, this is damaging. This is killing me more than it's healing me. And you have to, and making that step and, and having self-care is probably the most radical option that many, many of us have um, coming from marginalized communities. Yeah, I think so, something that I've very much learned is like, God wants the good for me that I want for other people sort of thing. So like the, you know the goodness that I want other people to experience the acceptance that I want other people to experience God wants that for me as well and so yes there's you know we we need to collectively um push back against injustice but yeah I think like you're saying there's a difference between God glamorizing or advocating for by you know violence and suffering and God's understanding and experiencing solidarity with those those who suffer and those those are different things um and I think that's, yeah, that fits in really well with the kind of things that we've been discussing about taking care of yourself. And, you know, this this season has been um, fairly, fairly brutal for everyone. Um, and in different ways, obviously, that's experienced on so many different levels. But I guess in, in kind of a, a lighter note, like where where do you guys feel at home and you can bring your full selves? Like what are the things that give you that that joy and, and that resilience to to do what you do?
Well, um, I can share, there was a point at which um, I was really struggling with how to integrate the fact that I'm a very academic person, um, but I also identify spiritually as Pentecostal. You know, that that's my history, that's my experience. And I will say the place that I had this experience where I really felt at home, where I went to, um, it was a Pentecostal uh, conference. So it was, um, it was for uh, Pentecostal academics to talk about um, Pentecostal studies and theology. And it was very academic. And I went to this one panel that was like um, about women in leadership. And that's still something that a lot of Pentecostal churches struggle with. And it's like how to be a woman in leadership and how to claim your ownership. It was very academic. It was very empowering. And at the end of it, they said, well, now we're going to pray for each other. And so we broke into small groups and um, there was like someone in my group who was like, um, you know what, I hurt my knee and um, I need some prayer for that. And sitting with someone else who was like, okay, and prayed for healing for her knee and tongues. And just being able to sit in that space and be like, feeling like that was a place where all of the parts of my identity were welcomed and and understanding why that that isn't the case for everyone but it was for me and that you know that's something that should never be forced on anyone but knowing that for me it was like that was a space where I was like I can bring my whole self here now I will qualify that by saying that um, I'm a straight person and I know that if I were queer um, and that were known in that space um, I would not have received the same level of welcome. So there's always that qualification, but yeah, it's complicated. Cool. There's, oh, sorry, yeah, go on, Rajiv. <laughs> um, Alan Bozak, um, was doing a lecture for the Durham Awards, it's on YouTube. And he made, makes a really helpful point because I was sat here trying to work out how to describe those churches where I have felt welcome. And he says, you'll know them by their fruits. You'll know them by, you know, you turn back to Jesus and you'll know, there was a sense in the church that has carried us while we're in Oxford. Um, and you just felt this envelope of love. And I know that isn't everyone's experience, um, and it was really interesting because the vicar, the vicar there at the time didn't want to be an inclusive church because he says, I'm a Christian. We are inclusive. We include everyone. Like, I don't need a label was his point because he was trying to reclaim in that way that the church is an inclusive church. Um, and it is, I think that is helpful that, that, that the Holy Spirit is with us. And I think, um, we have to take these words, um, the words of Jesus as, as, um, true and find some hope in that and know that there'll be a discernment when you when you find the, the place you're called to. Bro, um, I'll just catch up on a couple of the comments. Jill, Jill was saying, isn't Jesus lovely? I think that was um, a response to, to Faith, um, finding that she wanted to put Jesus in the centre again. Um, and we've got a couple of comments, just people sharing experience with the living, love and faith process and, and the barriers to engagement with that um, and how people, you know, in, in communities that can feel closed off when when people are confronted with anyone that is other, um, that that discomfort becomes hostility and, it, and it's hard to move on from that. Um, and I think that's something that we all experience in one way or another, like there's there is increased polarisation and, and division um in society around lots and lots of different issues um and issues of faith is just one of the ones where i think emotions particularly become come through very very strong um and dave was yeah sharing that um you know the often people are people feel like they can tell others what is safe for them and what isn't um which uh, yeah can come hand in hand with abuses of power and unfortunately um I've got a couple of a couple of questions. One for Faith from um, Liz. Um, it's a quite a specific one, but I think we can open it up as well. So um, 
for faith like how would we engage with parts of the bible where god is described uh, in a way that we'd consider to be either abusive or or violent like in hosea 2 is is the answer it so the specific example um that's been given but i guess i'd maybe open this up to like how again people from different experiences engage with the presentations of god that feel like um they are exclusive or uh, against what we we feel to be hold held true of god's character um so i don't know if faith you want to take the first bit I have to display my ignorance I, i'm not a, i can't be the chapter and verse christian so i don't know offhand what hosea 2 is so um if you can maybe if someone else wants to um begin if you can give me a second to like look it up because i want to be able to respond specifically to the question cool um now hosea 2 was there a specific verse in there or just the entire chapter let's see oh, oh the whoring Ooh, yeah mm. yeah that's a rough one um yeah i think that um man so one of the things that kind of um, helped me understand some of that better without excusing it is um, when I took um, ethics of sex, uh, Christian ethics of sex, understanding how in the Old Testament um, infidelity and whoredom um, are associated with idolatry. And so being used as a metaphor for um, unfaithfulness and cruelty toward God. And also, I don't really, I can't pretend like I've got a great answer to it. <sighs> I would say for me, when, when I come across passages like that, I have a really hard time with the Old Testament. I really like the New Testament. And when I'm approaching things like that, what helps me is remembering that I'm following Jesus and that was his tradition and when jesus preached he was always preaching out of those scriptures and some words of his that i find really helpful um, are you have heard it said but i say and so for me it's like whenever jesus expounds on scriptures that are abusive um like um eye for an eye and all this um he always points them toward a spirit of wholeness. So like this idea that, um, you know, you've heard it said an eye for an eye, but you know, it's, so he's taking to me, centering my faith around Jesus means that um, he spent a lot of time in those scriptures and he's like, look, this was your vision of this. This is what I have come to fulfill, not abolish, but fulfill. And you understand this God you've been worshiping through me. And so like, I can't like explain away scriptures like that, but when I'm confronted by them, um, I sometimes I'll just pray and I'll be like, God, Jesus, I, I, I can't even with that. And so, but you know, I worship you and I honor you and yeah sorry i don't have anything better than that the, either either of the other two do you want to touch on grappling with diff difficult bible bits or we can we can move on if we don't want to be put on the spot yeah raj what well, both of you yeah go um so i uh, did i haven't done much work on hosea too but text of terrors um generally and i think if we don't stop and just acknowledge that they're there, we're doing a pastoral disservice. We have to acknowledge that you know these things are here and they are horrific and they can be used in horrific ways. Um, so, like acknowledging and engaging and challenging them is like the first, like the first thing that comes to mind. And then leaning on something that I think was always obvious as a child to me, but growing up and reading and reading recently liberation theology and coming across this idea that the bible isn't a fact from heaven and that people have been actively involved and looking at the uh, this 
the culture and the power dynamics in the process of who's being remembered because like the Exodus tradition you can argue quite convincingly is actually a Miriamic tradition or mosaic tradition that it's the women that lead the way but it's been redacted away um Judges 19 is a horrific text um and it just remains being horrific um nobody ever talks about Hagar in Abraham they just go oh yeah you know Abraham went into her you know there's no consent there's no agency and oh yeah then he just left her to die in the desert and you know it's all cool um but actually there's there's with Hagar especially there's something there about she's the first person to name God in the Old Testament this Egyptian slave who's abandoned names God sees God and names God and names God something that's of her culture not of the culture that's abandoned her you are the God who sees me um and also sometimes with the Hagar story it's it's easier to to argue um not always reading ourselves as the heroes you know we are you know our voices call out across from the crowds in the crucifixion story rather than oh yeah i was i'd pick up the cross and help jesus i would be there you know you'd like to think that of the best of you but knowing where we are and our fallenness as well that that helps me with these these difficult texts um just coming um to it from from a slightly different angle um i mean my kind of experience is the the kind of verses that i used kind of say like you know god made man and woman and um you know like he made um you know night and day and um i think we have to remember that you know um that you know the bible was written you know in a time to help kind of people understand the, the, the kind of world around them um and you know just because god made um, you know, night and day. It doesn't mean that that dawn and dusk, you know, don't exist. Um, I like to kind of think that trans people are like the dawn and the dusk, because you know we're not in this binary. We're kind of outside um, of this binary. Um, you know, and and these categories were you know created to help people at the time understand things. You know, um, again, um, Haki talks about in his book about how you know the fish. Um, and how, you know, there's, 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 you know, scripture around, you know, the, the fish that's unclean and clean to eat and how that, you know, can be interpreted to see how people understand what food was safe to eat and what, and what food, you know, was unsafe to eat. And so I think these, you know, these, these scriptures, again, it's about in, in by interpretation and how we read them. But I think, um, yeah, I think it's all about, about the, the kind of context um, and how we interpret them. But yeah, I mean, I agree. Um, with everything that, that, that people have said as well. Thank you, yeah, and I think it's a good point to, to pick on, on with Luke as well in terms of that binary where not to just revert to, oh yeah, the Old Testament was bad and wrong and the New Testament is is good and great kind of thing, like not only can that become anti-Semitic pretty quickly, but um, also there's, yeah, there, there's just always going to be difficult things to, to try and understand um, and uh, but partly because of what we're dealing with, like we're dealing with stuff that's bigger than us, bigger than our own experiences and the lenses through which we we view the world. Um, so again, Liz, who answered the question, picking up on that, sometimes it is just difficult to introduce um, people or, or for people who have experiences of, of the kinds of trauma that are talked about to go and, and revisit the Bible and, and navigating that with people can be, can be really difficult. Um, I think, for me that again just emphasizes um the importance of creating safe and inclusive places like a lot of people um experience trauma and again something that um unfortunately church culture hasn't always been helpful with is allowing people to process and and talk about that in in a healthy way and in a supportive community um i think yeah there's um a few other comments from people um just trying to read quickly but um there's a few recommendations there so thank you for people for posting links and and things to read in in there um we had a question from david um again kind of on on our theme of bodies but what you know what do we make of the resurrection body um and do people feel that we will transcend our current identities or we take them with us wherever 
there is um how do yeah how do you guys relate to that we're doing nice simple easy questions today <laughs> Um, I'll I'll kick off to avoid a silence while everyone else thinks of better answers. <laughs> um, I think the body is a really challenging thing to explore in the scriptures to start with. Um, to circle back a little bit as well while we're talking about scriptures to um, the role of scripture in our faith. I think with some as with some churches, the word is everything. And but if you do church history, you suddenly realize that the word wasn't there at the beginning, like the, 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 the scriptures weren't there as they are now. The New Testament wasn't there at the beginning of the, the church when it was growing across the empire, etc. There had to be meetings to create the canon and councils. And so what were they using? Well, they were known by their actions. You know, you've got the book of Acts. So um, I think there's we forget that sometimes. Um, but to go back to the body, it was it, on the one hand, you've got all of these really difficult healing passages, um, which lead to really unhelpful conversations about healing or you've done something is it your sin. Um, but at the same time, and from the in those uh, on those lines of thought, you end up with, oh, then you should never change your body because um that's how god made you but then you've got braces in your teeth so you are changing your body so how deep does this theology run with you actually um and then on the other hand diving back into the old testament you have like the evil sisters of ezekiel 23 where you, this cultural idea of healing and wholeness don't necessarily mean a holiness a wholeness which means holiness doesn't require a whole body and so and that ties into what Jesus says in the New Testament, where he's like, if this part of your body causes you to sin, tear it off. That's not saying that your dodgy internet history means you should cut your fingers off, but it's a, it's just to demonstrate that there, there are these tensions. I, my, my grandmother constantly asks me, will we recognize each other in heaven? And the only thing I have to suggest maybe, or yes, is um, the resurrection experiences and also at the transfiguration, they knew who Moses and Elijah were. Um, and I don't think they were wearing name badges, but that's a very, uh, that's a very weak argument it feels to put forward, but that's all I've got. <laughs> um, I would say that the concept that like our, our bodies don't change or shouldn't change is bananas if you look at like in jesus's healing like the woman who was bent over and he heals her so he can stand up straight that's a pretty dramatic body change and i think um you know when when you're talking about healing and jesus is healing it's always this healing toward redemption and you know people are you know there's the idea of curing which is like healing of an individual ailment but also this healing of being restored into community like when Jesus releases um, demons from people, when he acts as an exorcist, it's always to be able to bring the person to a state of wholeness so they can be reconnected with their community. Um, in terms of resurrection bodies, oh, that's really exciting for me. I, I always grew up with the notion of heaven. And like, for me, it's like theologically at this point, I, I don't connect so much with the idea of going to heaven as I do uh living into resurrection um and the idea that you know my body is ultimately going to be wholly restored in relationship with jesus and others and the entire restored creation so this idea of um you know new creation and like i grew up reading the book of revelation like in a very particular way which was really unhealthy like you know, our world doesn't matter because God's going to burn it all down. But in reality, if you look at chapter 21, the idea of, you know, the, the new creation, it's this idea of that's something that we are living into and that ultimately in the resurrection, you know, my resurrection body, I don't know which parts, what it's going to be like, but I know that it's going to be God's best vision 
it's going to be a fully realized self. And that when people experience healings in the gospel and experience healings today, it's always toward that redemption. And it's always with the hope of full redemption and that our redemption now is only partial. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a really interesting, um, interesting question, um, really interesting topic, um, especially around kind of bodies and picking up on the ideas of kind of changing bodies. I think that's something that um, as a trans person, I, you know, I struggle with because, you know, this is the body that God gave me, but it's not the body that I would choose. Um, and I think, I think that's, the, that, yeah, that kind of idea that we shouldn't change our bodies. Um, you know, God kind of gave us the, the kind of power to kind of create and change. Um, you know, and as you said, you know, we have braces on our teeth and, you know, we, we change our bodies. And it doesn't mean that we're not, um, you know, honoring God. It's just that, you know, we, 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 we're becoming ourselves, we, 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 you know, becoming, um, you know, fully, fully ourselves. And so, um, yeah, I think it's quite a, a, a big topic to grapple with, but something that's, that, that is really interesting, um, you know, and I, I like to think that, you know, God didn't make me, um, you know, male or female, he made me fully who I am, he made me trans, you know, for a reason, um, you know, and gave me, and gave me that perspective. Um, but yeah, I think there's, um, I think there's, yeah, that's definitely um, a conversation that, yeah, someone's just said, you know, yeah, in God, there is no male or female. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, gender is a human concept, really. I mean, you know, if we are all one, you know, one in Christ, then, then you know, gender is, is just, it's just a, um, a concept that we came up with. But um, yeah, that's just my thoughts. Yeah, I, was, I, I wanna add something from my own experience into this, just because like, I, as someone who is, I'm, I'm doing a PhD in biomedical engineering. So for me, I kind of recognize the importance in in physical transformations in in terms of just that is so entwined into the way that our world our universe works like we are yes we have a physical presence and and that is so core to our sense of self and engaging with that but it's not static you know we grow from <laughs> from group a group of cells to a full human and then back again and and that those processes within nature are what allow us to have food, what allow us to have the physical world around us, which again is always changing, like rivers carve valleys, mountains get taller, like physical transformation is all around us. Like we're not existing in a, in a static state, in a static universe. Um, and we shouldn't expect ourselves to be static either, um, either in, you know, not, and, and that works in the way that I, in, in the way that we think, but also in, in the way that we feel in, in our bodies and the way that those change as well. Um, and so I, you don't know what that says about the resurrection body, but for me, I, um, I always am fascinated by the fact that Jesus really died. Like the, the death happened um, and we don't avoid that. And that holds a place in our world. Um, and the physical processes around death hold a place in our world that allows other life to happen. Um, and that's that's not a clear cut answer, but that's something that I've found myself always kind of going back to when discuss discussing these kind of things. Um, I've got a question from Philippa that I think would be good for us to touch on um, just as we start to, to round up. But how does the language and imagery we use for God in our inclusive, quote unquote, churches counteract the false image of God as male bodied? Um, yeah, I think that's really um really interesting um question how we we kind of challenge that i mean you know that typical you know association that you know god is is kind of you know male and male bodied um you know i think the use of um you know other pronouns um so you know you think um you know they or she you know just as like a you know very small kind of like act um in service just to to kind of i don't know acknowledge that you know 
that there isn't one way and um and to challenge that but um I'm not sure but but yeah that's that's something that I've been exploring you know traditionally growing up just referring to God as as he um you know now trying to use these different pronouns um yeah And so I remember in, in one lecture, um, the Old Testament lecturer saying, how many creation narratives are there? And you go, well, there's two in Genesis. And they said, what about the third one where the creator's feminine? And we're all in seminary going, what? And Proverbs 8 has wisdom describing the creation of the world. And I think, I think sometimes, looking at what we have and what images we have in the church and deconstructing them and seeing what what is helpful and what what isn't helpful and what's been hidden is is quite uh is it goes some way into like responding to to this question um because there are lots of images that we have that probably make no sense like jesus was most likely naked when he was crucified um because it was the ultimate humiliation um the the cross the cross member on the cross probably came down with jesus so there is tech, historically no such thing as an empty cross but if you say that in certain circles that's groundbreaking and you'll get excluded by it for saying believing those things um so i think there is there's great value into like actually looking at what are the things that we're saying and why are we saying them and you know in some settings that's a lot easier because in liturgy you can see the words in front of you, but also even in some of our worship songs, looking at what's, what are these images that we're saying? Does the father turn his face away when Jesus is on the cross? I remember singing that in, in, in the other place and then flicking through all three gospels, all four gospels, three, whoops, um, saying, you know, going, where is this? Um, and what have we added in for, for, for just emotive, emotive um, purposes? I would say from my perspective, um, for a long time, like as a neo-pagan, I just didn't use male imagery for God. I referred only to goddess. And um, for me, I had to come to a place where I found that limiting too. And um, I guess really my interest is and kind of bridging a space between how we understand traditionally like liberal and conservative Christianity and being like, well, if we're all part of the body of Christ, we're all in this journey together. And understanding one thing I learned in seminary that's very important is theology is always contextual. And the language that I'm using for God has to honor the space that I'm in. And if I, I'm quite comfortable using they and she for God, but if I'm conversing with someone or if I'm in a space where the gendered language that I use for God creates a barrier between us and closes another person off, I have to be aware of that too. And I still don't know how to deal with that, but I just acknowledge it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm personally like fascinated by language um and I studied it a little bit but not in any depth but something that's really stuck with me um we learned about something called the sapir wharf hypothesis um which is part of relativism um but essentially it's the idea that because we we think in language we formulate our thoughts through our language then our thoughts are limited by the language that we use um and so I think it broadening our language um, and again, it's, it feeds into when people are bilingual and, and being able to express things differently um, and removing kind of the cultural weight attached to some words um, can can really help in kind of broadening our ideas. And so I think, yeah, there, there is as places that set culture and create culture, um, churches almost have a responsibility to change it up every now and again. Otherwise, we're just naturally going to be set in in ways of thinking because that's the only way that we have to to kind of express it um that's kind of the the end of our time um 
well, I say kind of, it is, it is the end of our time. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to run through the last kind of few comments. Um, again, there's uh, kind of resources being posted. So I will go through and save some of them um, so that they're available for people afterwards because people are suggesting lots of really useful things. Um, uh, where will people be able to access that chat when you save it? Um, we will be sharing this um, kind of clip um, and so it'll have its own page and so it'll be on that page I imagine I'm looking at Danielle and she's nodding so <laughs> um, and yeah um, I'll post it on the the online event page and then we'll, we'll we'll have a document with the with the comments as well um, so yeah, and um, um, we're getting messages of thanks and I want to really, really echo that. Thank you so much um, to Raj and Nona and Faith for sharing in the way that they have. Uh, it's been a really powerful, amazing afternoon. And I know that, you know, talking about this stuff can take a lot out of you as well. So it's not underappreciated what, what you've brought and shared with us today. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Brill. Um, so this afternoon we have 